Fathers of Nations by Paul B. Vita. Chapter 1. Four strangers checked in at the Simon Hotel in Banjul one evening. None of them knew of the other three or about being one of the four, and this would remain the case because, unknowingly, the hotel assigned them to different rooms on different floors in different wings. First to check in was a man aged about 60 years. His hairline had retreated all the way back to his crown, but there it had held no more hair loss. He had a strange habit of smacking his lips as he talked, appearing to shape each word first and to add voice to it only after. Arrival formalities required him to complete and sign a registration card at the hotel's front desk. He signed it as Karanja Kimani, professor in the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Nairobi, Kenya. The hotel gave him a room on the fourth floor of its east wing. Next to sign in was another man aged about 70. He had a bushy mustache, which, in moments of speech, wriggled over his mouth like a moth fighting to free its wings, then fly away. The man registered as Ngobile Melusi, comrade and citizen of Zimbabwe. In the blank his card had for his occupation, he definitely wrote not applicable. The hotel allocated him a room on the fifth floor of the south wing. A younger man, aged about 50, also checked in. Big and flabby, he looked like a failed thumb wrestler. However, this feature was not evident now. He had buried it under loose robes, topped with one of those cone-like caps that always flop to the left side by design, not flaw. There was something about his eyes. They narrowed into slits when he relaxed, narrowed further when he smiled, and vanished altogether when he laughed. He registered as Chineke Chiamaka, pastor at the church inside Africa, CIA, in Lagos, Nigeria. He took a room on the sixth floor. Last to check in was yet another man, 40 plus years old. His walk seemed to be motion powered by rebellion. Was it a gesture of protest against someone or something? He checked in as Saif Tahir, engineer, formerly employed by the Ministry of Defense in Tripoli, Libya. He got a room on the third floor of the North Wing. Professor Kimani had been in his room for less than an hour when the phone there rang. He looked at his watch, not seven o'clock yet. He looked out of a window, pitch dark already. How fast falls the African night? Like a heavy rain of ink, he thought. He picked up the phone. Is that Professor Kimani? A male voice on the line asked. Professor Kimani did not respond. Hey, I heard you pick up, said the voice already irritated. So I know you are there. Look, I have an urgent message for you from AGDA. It's pronounced AGDA as one word. Actor. Hello, are you still there, Professor Kimani? This time, Professor Kimani responded. Agda, the Agency for Governance and Development in Africa, had sent him here to Bajul. Yes, I am here, he said. Good. Agda's message for you is that you accept me as your guide while you are here. Now, before you go worrying about that arrangement, let me assure you that I'll do everything I can to make your mission here a success. You have my word. Nigerian, Professor Kimani guessed from the way the man pronounced every stressed syllable. Educated Nigerian, he added this qualification after taking into account the man's impeccable grammar. Who are you? He asked. Later, snapped the Nigerian. Right now, I want to know if you have received a briefcase I left at your hotel for you. Professor Kimani looked at a briefcase his hotel had just delivered to his room. Yes, I have received it, he said. Just now, in fact, he added, I can't open it though. Did you scramble its lock, perhaps? It's 1124. I'm sorry, what was that? That was its combination lock. Set the lock on that. The briefcase should open. Now, before you do anything foolish, first make sure that it contains all the items 
that it ought to have. They are listed on a sheet that you will find inside. Oh, Professor Kimani, that was an order. The voice paused, expecting protest from Professor Kimani. When none came, it gave the rest of its demand. Obey, Professor Kimani, obey. Still, Professor Kimani did not protest. Excellent, applauded the Nigerian, clearly pleased with his quick victory. So, Professor Kimani, how much time will you need to acquaint yourself with the material in your briefcase? One hour? He did not wait for an answer. One hour it is then. Good night. Wait, Professor Kimani said. Haven't you forgotten something? Me? Forget? retorted the Nigerian, cocky educated Nigerian. Professor Kimani said to himself, now adding up all of his assessments about the man. I asked for your name. Who are you? Oh, that. Let's just say I am your guide, the man said. I meant your real name, Professor Kimani insisted. Instead of an answer, he heard the line die suddenly from the other end. Comrade Melosi got a similar call after. Pastor Chiamaka later, Engineer Tahir the last. All three said they had failed to open their briefcases. To all three, the caller gave the key. 1124. Dr. Folabi had someone call him from behind. He stopped working then returned to look. There she was. She was wearing a scarlet blouse, a black skirt and red high heels. Who was she? She was not anyone he could remember. Perhaps she had called someone else. He looked around. No one else had stopped. That made sense. She had called his name. She called again. Dr. Folabi, may I please have a word with you? She asked. With me? He asked. Are you sure? I am sure, right? Which means you will now follow me. This way, please. She led him to a corner with two chairs. So sit here. She indicated one of the two chairs. One minute is all I'll take. Well, maybe I'll take more, but five at the most. She sat on the other chair. One minute, five minutes. Where is the difference? He joked. Then he sat as well. My name is Mackenzie, she began. Fiona Mackenzie. First, let me thank you for agreeing to sit for this interview. Wait, can I tell you something else before I continue? You see, whenever I say my name is Mackenzie, people look at me quizzically, silently demanding an explanation. And the explanation, Miss Mackenzie, is what? He asked. I was adopted by Ian and Elspeth Mackenzie, Scottish missionaries. They are back in Edinburgh now but were in Banjul then. They took me in while I was less than a year old. Cute as a baton and sharp as a needle, he thought. Her eyes were wide and white like a pair of moons. She continued, My natural parents were Gambian, but I will never see them. They are dead. Oh, well. She wriggled in her chair. Goodness me, what am I doing? Dictating my autobiography. She waved that idea away. Let's talk business now, shall we? She pulled out of her handbag a small device, then switched it on. Mind if I start recording? You're a reporter? He had not thought she was. Yes, for the Gambian news. I see. Now, how can I help you, Miss Mackenzie? I'd like to ask you a few questions, if I may. Yes, you may. In fact... Why don't I start you off? My name is Abiola Afolabi, which you seem to know already. But you can just call me Abiola, my first name. Take it from there. I will. You studied at Harvard University in the USA. Now you teach at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. She smiles. I got that from the cover of your book, Failure of States. He averted his eyes to enjoy this fame in the correct manner, with humility he hoped she would easily see through. This black Scotswoman surely knew her trade, he thought. When I heard you were here at the Simon Hotel, Dr. Folabi, I decided to come and see you. So here I am. This is all so funny. Funny? Yes, I expected to see an academic scarecrow 
dressed in jeans. Instead, I see a well-dressed man who might well be a business person. I'm sorry I've disappointed you, Miss Mackenzie. Forty? What? Your age? Forty? No, forty-five. To my thirty-five, imagine that. Go have your picture taken right now, Dr. Folabi. You won't always look this good. I'm not joking. Go! Miss Mackenzie, was there something else you wanted us to talk about? She slapped herself on one cheek as if to punish herself. I was beginning to rumble on. Wasn't I? Enough. Now, then, Africa's heads of state will soon start a debate at the Pinnacle Hotel, two streets from here, and I'll be covering the debate for the Gambia News. I understand you will be an advisor to the heads of state during the debate. Could you give me some background? What will be the heart of their debate? They will be debating a document titled Way Omega. You see, not long ago, 20 Nobel laureates discovered a way to help Africa and then published that discovery in a document with that title. Africa's ministers for planning had a look at it. They liked it. Now Africa's heads of state are in Banjul to adopt it as a common development strategy for all of Africa. That's the background, Miss Mackenzie. Or did you want actual content? She shook her head. What are your expectations of the summit, Dr. Fulabi? What are my expectations? Please, don't get me started. I expect the summit to be a historic moment. If adopted, we Omega will change African politics dramatically. Just think. No more military calls, no more rigged elections, well, no more fall play, period. Dr. Falabi, not all of the heads of state assembled here are fair players. In fact, a few are out and out fall players. They rose to power through military calls or rigged elections. Those won't be walking along with Omega anytime soon, will they? Change is always like that, Miss Mackenzie. One side of it has defenders of existing arrangements. These, sure about their loss if those arrangements end, fight to the nail to keep them. The other side has challengers of existing arrangements. These, not yet sure about their gain if new arrangements replace old arrangements, do not fight so hard to win them. Huh? What did you just say, Dr. Folabi? You are not listening to me anymore, are you, Miss Mackenzie? Anyway, I was saying we Omega will put Africa on a new course, free from the obstacles that have defeated its past efforts. Imagine this, Miss Mackenzie. Africa without cause, without civil wars, without... He stopped himself. Look who is rambling on now, Miss Mackenzie. Yet, can you blame me? I told you not to go... And get me started, remember? Yes, I remember. And yet we have your book, Failure of States. Dr. Folabi, may I ask you something? What makes you this optimistic about Africa's future now? When in that book you are very pessimistic? Is it the content of We Omega or the prestige of its others? He began to dislike her. Miss Mackenzie, did you say my book was pessimistic? Yes, I did. Was pessimistic really the word you meant? You see, the word means... Let me try again, Dr. Folabi. What makes you optimistic now when before you were pessimistic? Miss Mackenzie, I heard you the first time. Then answer my question. I see I had totally misjudged you, Miss Mackenzie. He had seen alarm, vulnerable. Now he saw a lioness, dangerous. I thought you were a proper good-mannered journalist. Instead, I just see one of those fire eaters who confuse journalism with bad manners. Dr. Folabi, you haven't answered me. What joy do you get out of being rude to those who interview? What joy do you get out of being rude to those you interview? 
We like watching them explode from anger and then bleed. Is that it? Fine. But we have just met. What did I do that offended you? Let me put my question the other way, Dr. Folabi. Why did you come to this summit? Correction, I did not come. I was invited. That means presidents wanted me here. Repeat, presidents. They saw merit in the book you dismiss as pessimistic and wanted me to assure them that we Omega agrees with it. So who cares what you think? What do you know about books anyway? Let me tell you something, Miss Mackenzie. He changed his mind. A voice inside him was saying he had become too defensive. On further thought, let me not. I don't think I have to defend my book before anyone. Least of all, before that great reporter for the Zambian News. Gambian, she said. Whatever. All right, Dr. Folabi. Now, can you think through your book and give me an example? A specific example on which we Omega agrees with your book? Yes, I can. Her mobile phone rang. She answered it. As she did, she was already gathering her things, preparing to leave. Dr. Folabi, I have to go, she said. Silly boss wants me back at the office. Something has come up. Sorry. So, Dr. Folabi, in only one word now because I have no time left. What is the specific example you are about to give? Let me see if I understand you correctly, Miss Mackenzie, he said, suppressing hot anger. A man you claim is your boss calls you. Therefore, I must compress my example into a word. You know bosses, they don't like to be kept waiting. She picked up her things. Listen, I really must go. She rose and started leaving. Then she stopped. I could come back later. Would that be okay? Absolutely not. He almost shouted. Then what do you suggest? She asked. I suggest that you go read my book, not just its cover. He stood up. Now, if you'll excuse me, I too must be off. Have a good day. Forty-nine foreign heads of state were in Banjul for the summit. All looked happy. And why not? Had they not escaped from troublemakers in their home countries, they saw ahead of them a stay free from trouble here in the Gambia, a country everyone kept calling the land of Quinta Kinte. All hoped to get from their stay as much rest as possible. Of course, at them of course, at some point they would each take the floor and as fans back home expected address the summit, but this was something that they could do with little or no effort at all. For Gambians, though, the presence of so many visiting dignitaries was not fun. True, 49 heads of state could give a hosting country good publicity, but heads of state are a huge inconvenience, so this publicity comes at a high price. Nowhere is the price higher than it is in Africa. Here, before the dignitaries arrive, bulldozers dispatch at night in slum clearance exercises, demolish roadside kiosks on which whole families depend for their livelihood. Nowhere is the price higher than it is in Africa. Here, before the dignitaries arrive, bulldozers dispatched at night in slum clearance exercises demolish roadside kiosks on which all families depend for their livelihood. This way, the dignitaries will see that a few streets once had sidewalks. Roads get rare layers of tarmac at times of maximum traffic. Roads get rare layers of tarmac at times of maximum traffic. This way, motorists come to a standstill when it really hurts. Checkpoints sprout everywhere. This way, guards get even more basis for exhausting. This way, guards get even more basis for exhorting bribes from passersby. When the dignitaries finally, oh my God! 
When the dignitaries finally arrive, water taps at which wall neighborhoods queue to get just buckets of water dry up because now all water has to go to new water fountains built to mesmerize the visitors. Catastrophes can happen even at summits. At the Banjul summit, preventing them from happening was a joint responsibility of the Ministry of Internal Security and the Ministry of Defense. This meant both the police and the army played major roles. They came up with a very effective way of assuring that all heads of state would be safe. It was this. All heads of state, including the host, would stay in one place, the Pinnacle Hotel, located on the exclusive outskirts of Banjul. What this did was to reduce the 50 problems of assuring the safety of 50 guests scattered in 50 different locations to just one problem. That of assuring the safety of 50 guests concentrated at only one point. Security now became no more than the elementary task of ensuring that the Pinnacle Hotel became and remained an impenetrable fortress. This approach rested on two pillars, intelligence and combat. Intelligence meant secret agents melting into every holdout in Banjul. Their assignment was to investigate all rumors about plans to storm the Pinnacle and harm its new guests. That duty went to the police. Combat meant trained soldiers would engage in battle with any unauthorized person who did as much as come near the pinnacle. This duty fell on the army. The army was very clever about it. First, it trained the peli- Oh my God. First, it trained the perimeter fence and circling the pinnacle with a thousand soldiers. Then it deployed a hundred commandos in the compound inside the fence. Each of these soldiers and commandos outside the fence and in the compound within carried a rail gun. So, while the sky above may have remained open, the ground below was fully covered. This was very clever. There still remained Banjol's duty to extend to each head of state his or her due respect. This duty is commonly known as protocol. At the summit, it fell on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Internal Cooperation. What these ministries did was to divide it into two separate parts. The first was how to seat the heads of state at the feast. The Gambia was treating them to at State House on the day they arrived. The second was how to accommodate them at the Pinnacle Hotel where they would stay between their arrival and their departure. No one who has played host at a feast of more guests than just himself or herself needs to be told that the seemingly simple task of sitting guests for a meal is in fact a complicated business. Should this guest sit here and eat next to that one, or sit there and eat next to that other? The permutations and combinations that the host has to consider quickly become countless. For one guest, just one, there are already four options from which the host must choose. The guest could sit on the left or on the right of the host, or in front or even behind the host. For five guests, there are more than 700 such options. By the count of 10 guests, this number has jumped to over 30 million. The Gambia did not have only 10 guests. It had 49. In addition, they were not just guests. They were presidents. What happens when the guests are not just guests, but presidents? Now the host simply plays it safe. Eritrea and Ethiopia might seem one country, the host reasons, but their presidents rarely see eye to eye, so they should not be seated next to each other. On the other hand, the host continues to reason. Kenya and Tanzania agree more often than they disagree, so their presidents 
should sit next to each other and chat away in Swahili, and so on. This approach eliminates any options and, in that way, simplifies choice. In fact, when the host is entertaining only two or three heads of state, it works wonders. However, if instead there are 49, it is practically worthless because it leaves millions of options from which the host must choose. Then, what do hosts do at state banquets where guests definitely are many? They follow the United Nations. Like the UN, they ignore all rumors about who is speaking or not speaking to whom and simply sit everybody in alphabetical order. Come what may. Alphabetical seating has one huge advantage. It is easy because now there's only one way of seating everybody. A happier world than it is hard to imagine. Still, it has one big problem. Sitting everybody in alphabetical order means Algeria and Angola always get the best seats up in front near the high table. When the sound system or the lights fail, these two countries can still follow the proceedings. Unfortunately, alphabetical seating also means Zambia and Zimbabwe always get the worst seats. Way over there at the back, from where they cannot even see the high table. When the sound system fails or the lights go out, big problem. What other option is there? Scramble the alphabet and move Zambia and Zimbabwe near the high table and Algeria and Angola farther away from it. Aha! Uh -huh. People will not be able to find their seats that way. The trick they use to find seats works sequentially. Malians scan the sea of seats before them in sequence until they spot a Malawian or a Mozambican. Then they say, Eureka, our seats must be somewhere between those two. Now scramble this approach away. What happens? Chaos. Banquet halls cease to be navigable. So, Zambia and Zimbabwe can complain all they want, but their seats just have to be at the back. Algeria and Angola, way to go. Hotel accommodation involves two questions. First, what floor should this head of state or that get? Second, how many rooms should his or her delegation have? The first question was easy. Heads of state got floors up or down the pinnacle in the alphabetical order of their country's official names. Once more, Algeria and Angola got top floors under A, way to go. Botswana and Burkina Faso and Burundi followed under B. Now, attention, the Ivory Coast did not come under I. It came under C, among like among the likes of Cameroon, the Comoros, and Congo, because its official name is Côte d'Ivoire. Djibouti and the rest came after C. For some unknown reason, the Federal Republic of Nigeria did not come under F. It came under N, alongside Namibia and Niger. Zambia and Zimbabwe, of course, came last. The second question was how many rooms should a head of state's delegation get? This question sounds easy, but it is not, except for the United Nations General Assemblies. Africa's summits are the world's largest gatherings of heads of state. Moreover, each head of state is accompanied by a delegation with members of an unknowable number. So, how many rooms should a delegation get? This is not easy. Gabians can be clever. And in this case, they were. They assumed that all delegations, big or small, having arrived in Banjul safely, had to be equal, if only for that reason. Very clever. This assumption enabled them to divide the number of rooms available equally among all delegations. The result was four rooms per delegation, and that was that. Case closed. Chapter 2 
A mobile phone rang at the Simon's West Wing. Pastor Chiamaka answered it. The caller had phoned him earlier and identified himself as his guide. He was calling him again now, he said, to see how things were going. The time was 9 p.m. Pastor Chiamaka, is everything going okay? He began. Pastor Chiamaka was sucking pleasure from toffees that the Simon Hotel had sprinkled on his bed to sweeten the dreams that it assumed he would have. He swallowed that joy in his mouth first. Then he answered, Yes, everything is going okay, he said. Beside him lay an open briefcase. Did you look yet at the contents of your briefcase? Asked the caller. Yes, I did, he answered. Then you saw the letter from Agda, didn't you? I will return to it shortly. First, tell me this. What other items did you see in your briefcase? I saw a copy of the Omega, the development strategy that Nobel laureates have crafted to end Africa's misery and that Africa's heads of state are now expected to adopt at the summit. Go on. I also saw... Sorry? I also saw a copy of Path Alpha, the development strategy that Agda believes is a superior alternative to a Omega in that it hopes to slip in to replace a Omega. Good. Agda wants you to be fully familiar with both of these documents. Continue. I also saw some leaflets, pamphlets, and brochures from Agda. Skip those. What else? Well... I then saw this mobile phone, which I am using now. Excellent. Keep that mobile phone on at all times, day and night, rain and shine. From now on, I will be calling you often, even unexpectedly, but only through this number. So, always have the mobile phone on. Unlike your hotel phone, it is completely secure, which means I can talk to you on it freely. So, you will tell me your real name now? Pastor Chiamaka asked. My real name? My real name? Why? shouted the caller, angry all of a sudden. Well, why yourself? Pastor Chiamaka shouted back, also angry, answering fire with fire. If I don't have your real name, how can I even begin to ask for you? What I need to do so arise? What I need to do, oh my God. What I need to do so arise, I would contact you. The caller told him, ah, you can contact me, but I can't contact you. What is the matter? Are you afraid I might surprise you? Shut your mouth, snapped the caller. What did you say? Pastor Chiamaka asked. You heard me. Now get this. I want you to obey me, not to argue with me. You will not talk back to me like this again, ever. Do you understand? R -r -r right. Pastor Chiamaka stammered, suddenly turned. I yes, I do. Splendid. So, Pastor Chiamaka, let me say what I was going to say. If you had let me, pleased by his quick victory, the caller was inching back towards polite speech. What was I going? What I was going to say is, he stopped. Pastor Chiamaka waited. I was going to say that it's best if I keep on initiating all communication between us. The caller added, Pastor Chiamaka did not respond. Look. You and I are supposed to be working together. We are on the same mission. This time, Pastor Chiamaka responded. Then why won't you tell me your real name? I won't because our mission is still at a delicate stage, said the caller. For that reason, I'd rather you didn't know who I am yet. Until I tell you otherwise, just call me your guide. Needless to say, I won't let you see my face either, but you will hear my voice. 
Is there anything else you'd like to ask me? Why should I trust you? Ah, yes. Why should you trust me? Well, go back to the letter from Agda. It has the answer. Quote, you are not to have any less faith in him just because he identifies himself to you only by his alias of your guide. Unquote. The reference there is to me, Pastor Chiamaka. That is why you should trust me, okay? Pastor Chiamaka did not answer. Was that all you are going to ask? Again, Pastor Chiamaka did not answer. Fine, let's go back to way Omega and Path Alpha then. As I said, Agda wants you to be fully familiar with both documents. Are you Pastor Chiamaka? Yes, sir. The word sir had slipped out accidentally, but perhaps significantly, to show that Pastor Chiamaka had climbed down and accepted the role subordinate to that of the caller. Yes, I am, he added. Then there isn't any more left for me to add. Oh, actually, there is. I was there an hour ago. You were where an hour ago? Pastor Chiamaka demanded. To get right to the point, I saw you in the bar of the Simon Hotel. Yes, I was there, having a Pepsi. A Pepsi, is that right? Do you know what, Mr. Whoever you are? You are beginning to get in my nerves. Pastor Chiamaka was now thinking the caller might be an invisible executioner, unknowable and unidentifiable. You can see and identify me, but I could walk right past you and not know it. What were you doing here anyway, spying on me? I think it will be best if you apologized, Pastor Chiamaka. You want me to apologize? For what? For you spying on me? What business had you being in a bar, Pastor Chiamaka? Pastor Chiamaka felt a lump of anger arise in his throat only after he had remembered the injunction to turn the other cheek did he swallow his anger and apologize. All right. I had no business being in the bar, he said. It was a mistake, and I promise I won't do it again. You had better not, said the caller. The lamb threatened to rise again. Goodness me. It was only a soft drink. So you say, good night now, Pastor Chiamaka. Another mobile phone rang in the Simmons South Wing. Comrade Melusi answered it. Yet another rang in the East Wing. Professor Kimani took the call. Till another rang in the North Wing. Engineer Tahir spoke with the caller. The hour was now 11 p.m.